Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for the sermon, this day of the festival of the baptism of our Lord, is taken from the Holy Gospel, Matthew chapter 3, but especially verse 15. But Jesus answered John, saying, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. This is the text. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, dear fellow baptized. Matthew records for us that John the baptizer was preaching and baptizing in the Judean wilderness near and in the Jordan River. The scriptures say that all of Jerusalem was coming out to hear the preaching of John and to be baptized by him. And when they came out, they found a man not dressed in fine clothing, but rather they found one dressed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And maybe the picture of Elijah the Tishbite, the prophet of old, would have come to mind when they saw him. They would have heard a very stern message from John to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. John was nothing less than the very fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah who said that one would come to be the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. That was John. His holy office prophesied long before he was even born. It's also interesting to note that of this John, he preached about not only his own baptism, but also the coming baptism of Jesus Christ. For it was John who said, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In the midst of this kind of preaching and this activity of John the Baptist, guess who shows up? Jesus does. Not from Jerusalem, as many others had come, but the text tells us that Jesus had come from Galilee to the Jordan to John with a very simple request. John, you are to baptize me. John has a problem with the request. The text indicates that Jesus was, or that John was preventing Jesus, or would have prevented Jesus. For John, he saw his Christ. For John, he saw the one whose sandals he was not worthy to carry, or whose sandals he was not worthy to loosen. In Jesus, he saw one who would bring a baptism of the Holy Spirit and a baptism with fire. Lord, I baptize for repentance, for the forgiveness of sins. What are you doing here? And maybe, along with John, you and I might also see a little confusion going on here. What is Jesus doing, asking for the baptism of John? Well, as our Lord always does, he clears up the mess with a little sermon. Very, very simple little saying. He said, let it be so now, for it is, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all 
righteousness. And that was his answer. For you and for me today, let's think about for a moment this word righteousness in our Lord's little sermon. It is necessary for us, Jesus said to John, to fulfill all righteousness. The psalmist talks about God's righteousness this way. Listen to the text. O Lord, in your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day. The psalmist will not have a theological term that only resides in the academia of theology. In other words, the righteousness of God and displayed throughout the Old Testament would not be the kind of righteousness that would be sort of a question on a confirmation exam that everyone would get right. But it would be just only an idea. Oh no, that's not God's righteous activity. God is the doer of righteousness. An idea, but also an idea with four. The God who would say that righteousness must be fulfilled would do it by being busy and doing something. Over and over again throughout the Old Testament, God is busy saving his people. Not simply by saying, I'm going to save you. Hope you figure it out. I'm going to save you. And then God steps into the messiness of humanity and brings about the salvation as a gift, as a gift for his people. Jesus said to John, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, John, there's some doing of righteousness that needs to be done. Therefore, you must baptize me. Well, what is it that Jesus was to do? It's God's saving activity in John's baptism. <clears throat> His doing was this. That he was to step into the waters of the Jordan River... And he was to assume for himself the sins of all people. In other words, we might say in Jesus' baptism, his being baptized by John, that Jesus was to be declared the sin bearer of the sins of all humanity. Or the Jew? And for the Gentile. And you see, that's part of the epiphany message that comes through here. The sins of all humanity. Jesus was to be under the law for you and for your salvation. The apostle would go on to write it, say, speak this way about it. He would say, God made him who knew no sin, to be your sin for you. Do you see that? In his baptism then, our Lord fulfills all righteousness by being declared sinner, even while he had no sin. That means your sin, dear friend, was put upon our Lord Jesus Christ in his baptism. That's where today meets some 2,000 years ago. Yes, all of your dirty little secrets laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Your sins of omission, your sins of commission, your sins of lack of trust. 
your sins of unbelief and doubt. All of it laid upon the Lamb of God. And I find it interesting that after Jesus is baptized, John goes on to preach a little differently about Jesus. He says in the Gospel of John, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is to say that John got it. In seeing Jesus baptized, in hearing the voice of the Father thunder from heaven, this is my beloved Son, in him I am well pleased. In seeing the Spirit light upon him as a dove, John sees the approval of God the Father. He has given his Son to be the sin bearer. And in his receiving of that in his holy baptism, the Father and the Spirit approve. There is agreement among the Godhead. What Jesus does, the Father approves and the Spirit rests there. In calling Jesus the Lamb of God, those who would have heard the preaching of John would have also known what was going on. For it was common that a goat would be taken. Usually the leader of a clan, the father, would take and press his hand down upon the little goat. In a way which signified that the sins of the father, but also the sins of the father's clan, would be laid down upon the goat. And the goat would be marked as the sin bearer for the family. And then the goat would be let go into the wilderness. Which really points to the sermon for Ash Wednesday, doesn't it? What is it that happens after our Lord takes upon himself, fulfilling all righteousness there in Jordan's river? The Bible says, Matthew chapter 4, that the Spirit of God that lighted upon him leads him out into the wilderness. Forty days and forty nights. Our Lord endures the temptations that all of mankind would know. Endures it for you as your scapegoat, as your sin bearer. Maybe we might hear it this way. Jesus would say to you, you are no longer a sinner, but I am, Jesus says. I am your substitute, he says. All your sins rest on me. That's how Luther preached on this sermon. That those hearers in his day would understand that their, their iniquities taken off of them and placed upon the Christ. We know the rest of the story. Jesus the one who bears the iniquity of mankind, lives a holy life, surely the Son of God, very God of very God. And he bears those iniquities all the way to Jerusalem, just a little outside of Jerusalem, actually, to the place of the school, Mount Calvary. And the substitute for sin pays the penalty for sin. He's crucified. Sin paid for. And the fullness of the great substitute for us, his mission accomplished, rises again on the third day. And the proclamation of the resurrection becomes this of the risen Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Why? 
Because Jesus' baptism is there also in your baptism. The substitution already made, but all the gifts of baptism poured out over your little heads for Jews and for Gentiles. So that what the Bible says about baptism remains true because Christ is our substitute. For it is written, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. For it is written, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ has been raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, you, you too, might walk in newness of life. For it is written, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. Since Christ is our substitute, since His death made perfect atonement for the sins of the world, the little sacrament of baptism means the world for you, dear friend. And the church is to administer it and proclaim it throughout the world. Who would ever think about withholding baptism? Such a beautiful gift from the least in the world. Who would ever think about withholding that sacrament from a little child? From a Jew, from a Gentile? The epiphany message, the epiphany gospel is this. That baptism is given as the sacrament for all people. And that God desires in his church that it be administered according to its institution. That all might be included into the death and resurrection of Christ. That the church might walk in newness of life. And that those of us who are baptized, even though in our baptisms we find ourselves going wayward, tossed to and fro in a sometimes a very miserable world. God is faithful. His atonement for your sin is sure. And even while we live in baptism, we find at times rejecting the very Christ who was our substitute find ourselves wanting to deny the Christ who died for us. Return to your baptism, dear saint, for Christ has called you to a glorious station. And what he promised then, at one time in your life, at a font with water with a pastor, he remains true to throughout your life. Therefore, return to your baptism daily, that we might rejoice, that you might rejoice in the Christ who was baptized for you and for your salvation. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please rise. <coughs> May the peace of God, which truly surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat>